All right. Welcome back to another episode of Bear's Guide to a Five. This is a very important episode. I'm very excited for this because this is one of those points in the class where everything really starts to come together and everything you've learned so far really... I don't know. It just comes together at this point. So we are going to tackle how colonialism affected the growth of states. I know. I brought up colonialism. I've talked about it with language. I've talked about it with religion. I've talked about it with migration. But now we are finally going to talk about colonization. So what the heck is colonization? Colonialism, or colonization, is when an area's internal or external affairs are controlled by another state that area is sparsely inhabited. Look, it's easy. Basically, an area's affairs are controlled by someone else. They don't have sovereignty. The best example, when we were a colony, the United States, we were controlled by England, right? We could make laws here. We could do whatever. But yeah, we were a stateless nation. Look at that. Anyway, colonialism, though, has a lasting impact, especially when the colony or what was colonized um, isn't successful after the whole colonization process is over. So that's what we're going to talk about today because nine times out of ten, when a colonizer leaves, the old colony does not do well. So first we have to talk about our spatial patterns because, of course, there's a spatial pattern or a spatial distribution. And what we know, this theory is called the north-south divide or the Brandt line. This is generally something that separates more developed countries from less developed countries. And I know that's a word we haven't really talked about a whole lot because we were so focused on culture recently. But now we are bringing this idea back again. And notice that with developed countries and developing countries, it's the same countries who were the colonizers and who were the colony right? So it's this trend and it's like, wow, who would have ever thought that the people in the past with more money and more power who colonized other people and took their stuff are somehow more successful today and those that were colonized aren't? Wow. It's like crazy or something. So who possessed parts of the world in 1914? If you can't tell, it's Europe. Europe possessed the world in 1914, or at least a lot of it. And then we ask, who possessed parts of Africa in 1939? Look, it's all Europe again. So you're talking, this stuff, you know, when we talk about colonization, we're not talking about something that happened two or 300 years ago. We're talking about something that is coming up on its 100th birthday. The colonization of Africa was less than 100 years ago. So after World War II, in the 1950s and 60s, we see a lot of independence movements. A lot of these old colonies want to gain sovereignty. They want their own state. They have the ideas of self-determination. But the thing is, to, to tie into that, these old colonial powers don't have money after World War II. To compound the problem is that these colonies that were created, their borders, their formal regions, were created by their colonizers. And they didn't care about the different ethnicities or nationalities that existed. They didn't care about ethnic conflicts. They didn't care about potential shatter belts. They didn't care about differences in religions or languages or cultures because they were colonizers. All they wanted was gold or diamonds or whatever resource they wanted. So all they cared about was themselves, and they put these people together. So all of a sudden, you have these colonizers who forced people to live together, who historically would not live together. They drained them of their natural resources, and then they left. So there are three main impacts from this process. There's the economic impact, because now the country has to generate revenue after being colonized. Now they have a developmental problem. How is this country going to build cities and infrastructure for its people? How are they going to provide roads and hospitals and electricity? And then finally, we have the ethnic problem. How do people in a country get along with deep ethnic differences that run back for thousands of years? that now suddenly they have to live together, and not only live together, but govern successfully. These three things are why countries struggle so much after being colonized. So look at what's crazy to think here. When we're asking the question, when did these African colonies gain their independence? Guys, your parents were probably alive when it happened or just recently born. I mean, we're talking... There's some in the 50s, there's some in the 60s, there's some in the 70s here. Mozambique got their freedom in 75. 
So we're talking about very fragile states that are just getting their freedom, their sovereignty. And now they are tasked with the immense job of successfully governing. So the first impact, we have to talk about development. Now, the colonial power only developed the part of the country they needed, part of the colony they needed to get those resources. And what this caused was this core periphery relationship in the colonies. And I'm going to talk a little more about that later in the lesson, so I don't want to get too caught up on that right now. But let's think about this. If you're a colonizer and you're going to a country because you want its resources, and we're talking about the times and even now the best way to transport stuff is by the ocean on boats, well, what are you going to develop? You're going to develop the coastal areas of these colonies because that's where your ships can dock, that's where you can load up the ships, and then you bail out. So most large cities are in the coast of LDCs because they have an export-oriented economy. Look, when they were a colony, say they exported, you know, bananas to the UK, right? And, you know, they didn't get paid for it in the past, but now that they're not a colony, well, what are they going to do for money? And they're like, well, the white people in England really like these bananas, so why don't we sell these bananas? And that's what they do. They become an export-oriented economy. Now, what happens is that they start making money in these export-oriented economies, and they invest more money into the infrastructure, but they're only investing in that coastal area because they know that's where all the money is generated. So the interior of the country ends up suffering, that rural area. And already your ears should start to ring a little bit with these ideas of migration that we've talked about in the past. Our second impact is ethnicity. The fact is that these colonizers drew whatever borders they wanted to fit their colonies to get their resources. They didn't care about different ethnicities. They didn't care about different religions or languages. And the fact is that now people are forced to live together and govern together successfully. If you look at this picture, the red lines are ethnic divisions. The dark lines are their formal regions of their country. Could you imagine having 5, 10, 15 different ethnicities with deep, deep differences culturally suddenly being forced together? How can you even expect them to govern when they still have to work out the ethnic differences between them? And then our final impact is the economic impact. And I kind of talked about this with development a little bit. But the European powers took colonies to get their resources. And then when they got their resources, they sent them back to their home country, the UK specifically, and in the example I have, for example, when uh, the UK conquered or colonized India, they took their raw cotton and took them back to British factories in the Industrial Revolution to make cotton goods. But what this does is it prevents the colonies from developing their own industries, their own economies. So India was, for this example, India was trapped at exporting the cotton, so when they're no longer a colony, they go, well, how do we make money? Okay, let's just keep exporting cotton. But that's not a long-term goal. That's not something you can stick with for a long time and make a lot of money and develop and move on. If they would have been able to go through the process of industrialization on their own, they would have went, wait, we can take this cotton and we can make our own factories, we can make our own product and sell more money, or <laughs> sell more money and sell more to make more money. So we have to understand that this impact of colonialism really hindered the economic development of countries. So now we're going to explore this theory of the core periphery relationship. Now, way back in Unit 1, we talked about globalization, and we know that stuff is harvested from one place in the world, sent to somewhere else in the world to be manufactured, and then ultimately sent to the place to be consumed, sold, so on and so forth. This theory is only backing up that idea, and now we're tying it to colonialism too. Because of colonialism, now we have this theory that exists in the world, that the world is split between an economic core, a powerhouse, people that have money and power over the world and decision-making on where things are made and harvested, and an economic periphery, the one that does not get a say in anything, the one that hopes they can get a job collecting a resource or making something. Now, there are three types of countries in this theory. There's the core, as I mentioned. There's the periphery, as I mentioned. But then there's that semi-periphery, that in-between country who has some power but not a lot of power. Now, this chart helps a little more. This map, uh, this Robinson projection of this Korapleth map, of course, semi-periphery and periphery countries. And now the scale we're looking at is a very small scale because we're looking at the entire world. But the fact is this relationship is something that happens between countries. If you notice the countries in the periphery, that's where our raw materials come from. Uh, lumber, 
uh, diamonds, oil, whatever it may be, they come from these periphery countries. And then we know that the raw materials get sent to factory or factories in countries where they'll be made the stuff for us to consume in the developed world. Well, we know that South, Southeast, and East Asia have tons of factories where people live. So it's no surprise that those countries with the factories are the semi-periphery. They're like the next step. Factories make a little bit more money than those who just collect the raw materials. And then, of course, those countries that dictate all of this, the ones that decide where things are collected, where things are made, and then ultimately sell those things and buy those things, are the countries in red, that core countries. We're talking United States, Canada, Western Europe, Australia, Japan. Just to give you another visual, we have this. You have countries at the core, you have countries at the periphery. The periphery provides low-wage labor and raw materials to the, the core and the semi-periphery, while the core provides high-profit value added goods, right? Those final products, selling them all around the world. But this is just a global scale, a small scale. We can change the scale. We can enlarge the scale and use the same idea inside of countries. All right, so we just talked about how we can use the core periphery at a state scale or a global scale, small scale globally, but we can also use the same theory within a developing country. Now, it only works for developing countries. This does not apply to the developed world. This only applies to developing and high developing countries, right? That's it. Don't ever use this for an MDC or a core country. But if we zoom in and we increase the scale, we can see that in developing nations, there's a core area and there's a periphery area. And this core periphery relationship, especially in LDCs, is oftentimes a relic or an artifact or a leftover of colonialism. This is kind of like all three of those impacts that we talked about with the impacts of uh, colonialism tied together. We know that the old colonizers went to these places to get the resources. We know that they built up the coastal areas because that just makes sense. That's where they're going to build to ship more things back to their country. They're not going to spend money and time developing the interior rural area because it doesn't make any sense to. That doesn't make you more money. What makes you money is that coastal area. And the example I really like to use is Brazil. Now, this is a choropleth map of the Human Development Index of Brazil. And the Human Development Index, if you don't remember, is a measure of development based on education, life expectancy, and how much money people make. And clearly, if you look at the map, you see that in the rural areas, you have low development. It's the periphery area. It's the interior of the country. And if you look at the coastal regions, there's a high development core area along the coast. Now, this should really start making you think back to migration and population and stuff like that. And we're going to build on this more. But it's really reinforcing this idea of this internal migration where people come from that low development periphery area, travel to the coastal areas, those urban areas, and build those urban cities. We know this is the migration trend in the developing world. And now we know why, right? Why is it that the rural areas of these countries are poor is because of colonialism. So it motivates them to move to the coast. But the thing is, so many people are moving to the coastal regions of these old colonies, and it's overloading the urban areas. And as you can see in this picture in Rio de Janeiro, right, you see these huge skyscrapers in this beautiful downtown area. And then right below it, you see like these makeshift homes because there's just so many people going there because that's where the opportunities are. The fact is, the biggest impact of colonialism is the fact that we have super concentrated wealthy places in these colony and these old colonies and not enough distribution of infrastructure, education, healthcare, all that stuff. And it's becoming a massive problem in the developing world that they have to tackle. And we can see it in this picture. And we'll explore it more in class. So what do you need to know today? Well, you got to know what colonialism is, basically. You have to understand the spatial distribution of colonizers and colonies where they were, that whole Brant line, that north-south divide. Know and explain the three impacts of colonization, the economic impact on the old colonies, the developmental impact on old colonies, and the ethnic impact on old colonies. And then finally, understand the core periphery model at a global scale and how we can apply it to countries like Brazil 
and tie it back to previous things we've talked about. If at any point in this you have any questions, make sure that you wrote them down so we could address it in class. Make sure to hit that like button and subscribe button, especially that bell icon so you can be updated when there's new videos. As always, this was Bear's Guide 205. I'll see you next time.